Hello, everyone. My name is Gary Parker. My pronouns are he, him, and I am the Associate Dean for External Affairs at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, where I also have the great privilege of directing the Clark Fox Policy Institute. And welcome to Open Classroom. I am standing in for uh, Cynthia Williams, your usual co-host for these events, along with uh, my colleague, Janet Gillows, the Director of Professional Development and a good friend. And this open classroom is a way for us to open the virtual doors uh, to the Brown School at Washington University, allow you an opportunity uh, to connect with our faculty, with our uh, teachers, with our researchers, with our students and alums, uh, and let you just kind of get an insight into all of the amazing work that's happening here at the Brown School, and also hopefully introduce some new topics to you and offer some professional development all of this, of course, is um, free of charge to our community. And Janet, I think that we've been doing this for almost a year now. We, you know, we should have some sort of annual celebration for Open Classroom because this has really taken off in ways in which we really hadn't imagined. Uh, I know Janet is gonna share with you a few of the upcoming programs, but I did wanna highlight just one. It's a really interesting one. On March 2nd, uh, we at 1230, We'll have Mark Rank, uh, who is not only a, a faculty member uh, here at the Brown School, but is a best-selling author. And he's going to be talking about his latest book, Poorly Understood, What America Gets Wrong About Poverty. And Mark Rank is really one of the foremost authorities in understanding uh, American poverty. And I know that is going to be an exceptional program. And Janet, I think we have already over 800 RSVPs for that. So you know, uh, we, we encourage you to go to the Open Classroom site where you registered for this one, register for that one and some of the other programs. Uh, one last uh, kind of program point, uh, although we have uh, disabled your microphones and your cameras so we can't see or hear you, we want you to be engaged in today's conversation. So please use the chat features to send us your thoughts, send us your questions, post resources. Uh, that you may want to share. Uh, the option at the bottom, you'll have an option that says just to panelists or to panelists and attendees. So you can decide whether you just want uh, us to hear about it or you want to share it with everybody who's here today. So uh, please, you know, feel free to join in on the conversation. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to the most amazing uh, co-host ever. Uh, again, she's the Director of Professional Development, Janet Gillow. Gary, thank you so much and welcome everyone. Loving this audience. You guys are already checking in to say hello and, and sending some questions your way, our way. So one thing I do want to note is today's recording um, will be available on our YouTube page. Um, and I'll also throw that as well as the opportunity to register for programs like the one Gary mentioned in the chat in just a bit. Uh, the program with Dr. Rank is in just a couple weeks, but next week we have three, count them, three webinars coming for you. So um, on Tuesday, we have Lee Kolaker uh, speaking to us about making career moves in the virtual space. So for anyone who is changing jobs, changing roles in a team, um, he's going to have some insights to share. On Wednesday, we have a wonderful panel uh, from Better Family Life, fantastic organization here in town, talking about COVID response in an urban neighborhood. And then on Thursday, we have a, just an amazing panel of accomplished African-American women speaking to us uh, regarding their experiences with misogynoir and um, their thoughts to help us imagine a more equitable landscape. Um, so those are what's coming next, but we've got great stuff for today. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Associate Professor Sharita Butler Barnes is a developmental psychologist. Her expertise and scholarly work is on the impact of racism and the use of culturally uh, strengths-based assets on educational and health outcomes of Black American families. She has a particularly strong interest in understanding and encouraging the conditions that allow Black girls to flourish. So anyway, please welcome Dr. Sharita butler Lawrence for today's talk. Thank you for the wonderful introduction and thank you all for being here, for joining me this afternoon. I'm very excited to talk about um, Black families and particularly what's going on. Um, I am looking forward also to the end of this presentation so we can engage in some rich discussion about um, some of the work that I'm going to present to you all. And so again, I'm Sharita Butler Barnes, Associate Professor here at the School of Social Work. And so the title of this talk, Pro-Trump Era, Resistance, Hope, and, Mobil and Mobilizing Among Black American Families. 
And so today I'm going to be talking about racial violence in America, pro, the pro-Trump era and white supremacy, COVID-19 and black families, how racial violence impacts that as well, the social historical integrative model for the study of stress in black American families, which is, will be a tool that I think that would be useful as we engage in our work with black families. And then I'm going to talk about specific ways in which we, be, we can begin to dismantle um, anti-black racism in research and practice. And so one of the things that I love to start off with, especially with my students, is just making sure that we have a common knowledge um, of what we're going to be talking about today. So this is something that I, you know, I think that um, making sure that all of us on this Zoom understand the extent of racial violence in America and the implications it has on Black families now. And so Black families, Black Americans have a long history of experiencing hate acts and violent crimes in the United States. Lyons found that anti-Black hate crimes were more prevalent in white communities. And so what does that mean? Um, as communities began to diversify, um, then you see a rise in anti-Black hate crimes. And also some of the latest findings suggest that anti-Black hate crime is significantly increasing in the United States. And so racial violence in the United States since 1660. Again, for this presentation, it is particularly important that we all have an idea of the historical racial violence in the United States and the way in which this impacts Black families to this day. And so I want us to sit right in, on some of these screens as we look at the racial violence that has occurred and the racial violence that's documented. And so I also want to point out that if you want additional information on these racial violence that has occurred, you can go to blackpast.org. The link is in the bottom of the screen. And as you sort of, um, you can select, for example, um, Nat Turner Revolt, and it would give you additional information on that. And so we have the revolt of the enslaved. We have antebellum urban violence. We have civil war, reconstruction, and post-reconstruction era violence. We have the race riots, 1900 to 1960. We have urban uprisings, 1960 to, to the year 2000. And then we have college campus violence. And then we have 21st century racial violence. Adding on George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Sandra Bland, the list goes on, right? And the way in which those murders sort of also enhance, sort of exacerbated the current conditions in terms of what we see now. And so the reason why I show this is that for a couple of reasons, it's important that when we talk about racial violence in America, that we don't look at this as a trend, that we have to understand the way in which black families have had to contend with these things intergenerationally. And so that means that when I say intergenerationally, I'm talking about the oral tradition of telling stories about these particular incidences intergenerationally and how somehow while the world attempts to move on from things because it's trendy when we tend to see it, black families have to sort of deal with that in this moment and the implications for their family. And so again, racial violence in America and the way it shaped African-American families. And so also I wanna make sure that we understand the different forms of racism that we are talking about. Right? I want to make sure that we have a common language, right? To make sure that we can enrich and, 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 and sort of talk about um, um, rich discussion, right? So, so we can have those rich discussions. And so the different forms of racism, internalized racism. So this lies in the person. It comprises biases about race and racism, superiority beliefs or entitlement by white people and internalized oppression, negative beliefs about oneself. Interpersonal racism occurs between persons. So biases that occur through interaction and when one's own personal racial beliefs influences those interactions. So this happens within an interaction with another person, right? Interpersonal racism. And then we also have institutional racism. 
And this occurs within institutions and systems of power in our universities, in our K through 12 schools and in workplaces. So you have these racist practices and unfair policies that already exacerbates inequitable outcomes for people of color and advantages white people. And so one of the things I wanna make clear in this presentation is that white people have power and you have been to benefited from a system that has historically advantaged you. Even if you don't want to acknowledge it, the system has. So this is the way in which institutional racism operates. And then we have structural racism. So this is racial bias among institutions and across societies, historical. And so one of those examples can be redlining. Redlining does Jim Crow's work, right? Our schools are funded based on redlining, the way in which we have access to healthcare agencies, the way in which we have access to grocery stores. This is redlining, right? So it does this work. And so the reason why I'm talking about the different forms of racism is that we could be only focusing on one form and not the others. So just because we focus on one, for example, when we say that we want to dismantle structural racism, that doesn't mean that we're addressing institutional, inter interpersonal, internalized racism. And later on, we'll see vicarious racism, how that operates, but we'll talk about that later on. So again, it's important that we start from a common knowledge and recognizing and only the fact that there are different forms of racism. So let's get to the pro-Trump era and white supremacy and what that looks like. And so Perry examined Trump's response to the white supremacist violence that happened in the Charlottesville riot that led in the death of Heather Hare and found that his response was not necessarily to what those um, um, white supremacists did, but more to this idea of this erosion of whiteness, right? Being threatened that whiteness would disappear because we are living in a America that's really diverse and will be so much more so by 2030, right? So he was responding to that. And also research has shown that participants who denied that Trump's policies were harmful to communities of color were more likely to endorse colorblind racism. So they don't see color, color does not matter, right? And so colorblind racism is very, very harmful. Right? And so again, participants who denied that Trump's policies were harmful to communities of color were more likely to endorse these color to, to endorse colorblind racism. And also Swain found that whites who voted for Trump tended to support excessive use of force by police officers and endorse negative racial stereotypes. Okay, so it's important that we sort of look at this in perspective because this is right now what we have when we see the Black Lives Matter movement and then the automatic response is Blue Lives Matter, right? So these, these, these sort of movements has its roots in white supremacy and nationalism. And we need to be very mindful of that. So again, in this presentation, um, history is particularly important because it's important to understand the ways in which racial violence has impacted Black families and how the pro-Trump era, the Trump era, that's still continuing now, is, 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 is causing some of these things, right? The latest attack on the Capitol. And so now we have, it was a research study that came out where Tower and Power underscored the importance of the Black vote. And so in that, Black people would need to mobilize to counter Trumpism. And so the removal of Trump would be through voter turnout. And so we saw these efforts in this election, right? Stacey Abrams, we saw the dynamic work of African-American communities. And so we saw a resistance to this, right? But again, thinking about the historical vestiges of slavery um, um, and, and, and Jim Crow laws and racial violence that just has occurred, we see now the importance of the vote and why this, and, and, and why this meant so much in this pro-Trump era. Right? And so how does this impact Black families in a COVID pandemic? Well, we see a lot of the statistics, right? The statistics note the fact that Black populations in the United States have been devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that. Today in the United States, Black Americans are more likely to die from COVID-19. The pandemic has also taken a financial toll on Black families. For instance, Black Americans are losing their jobs and they're more likely to serve as essential workers in the United States. Today, Black Americans account for 15% of COVID deaths. Black Americans are more likely to experience death of, fam of family members in comparison to their white families, right? However, at the intersection of grief and crisis, 
we have this racial violence that's going on, but we also have this COVID-19 pandemic that is really exacerbating already existing health, educational, and economic disparities that were there, right, as a result of slavery and Jim Crow and the racial violence that has consistently been happening since 1660 in the United States, right? So this is what Black families are contending with. Like, this is what they have to deal with. And so how does this impact Black youth development, right? So we know um, how COVID as is, has, it is currently has and is currently presently um, impacting um, Black American families. Um, we also know the way in which it shows up and, and, and the role of racial violence, but then now let's talk about black youth development. And so because of the social positioning of adolescents, that's their race, ethnicity, class, and gender, um, um, this is all associated with the type of experiences they encounter on a daily basis. And so in a racially stratified and oppressive society, black youth grow up and must figure out who they are and what they can achieve while sort of navigating these dehumanizing stereotypes that devalue and disregard Black lives on a daily basis. And so these realities are also intensified at the intersections of race, class, and gender, meaning that there are unique experiences for Black boys and there are unique experiences for Black girls, right? And other social identities as well when we talk about the intersection of those things. And so again, we have to be mindful of intersectionality. And so for adolescents, racial discrimination is a common occurrence for African-American adolescents, so much so that African-American adolescents perceive more than five racial discrimination experiences per day, more than five. And this just doesn't only involve the interpersonal interactions, right? This also includes vicarious racism. So this is this idea that you're hearing others say disparaging comments about your racial and ethnic group. It might not be directed towards you, but this is what's happening. Adolescents are seeing these things on social media. They're hearing persons within their classroom talk about it within their community. So when we talk about Black adolescents experiencing more than five racial discriminations experiences per day in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, in the midst of racial injustice, we have to think about the well-being and how this is impacting their educational trajectory, right? How they see they how they see themselves and who they are. And so the historic, the socio-historical integrative model for the study of stress in Black families. This is a model that um, I developed along with Velma Murray. She's at Vanderbilt University. And we were very much interested in giving a model two particular fields of medicine, public health, psychology, social work, and putting a model out there that forced, that um, encouraged, that would be intentional about talking about the historical vestiges of slavery and Jim Crow laws and how that contributes to black family stress in America. We wanted to be very intentional about that because in some of our work, Okay, when we talk about black families, we sort of disassociate the past with, with, with what's going on now. And we didn't wanna give people the option to do that. And so this model has been used in various areas. We were excited to see it um, since 2018. I am very excited to see it in different fields. And so it really highlights the historical vestiges of slavery and Jim Crow laws by um, um, centering race-related, economic, social, and political histories of Black Americans in the U.S. The current contextual, I'm sorry, the current sociocultural contextual stressors of racism, prejudice, discrimination, oppression, and marginalization, oppression and marginalization, the social positioning, path C, as we see here, how that impacts promotive and inhibiting vulnerabilities of families. What does that look like? Our interactions, our day-to-day -day experiences. And also the institutional systems, the structural aspects of these mundane, extreme environmental stressors, our educational systems, employment opportunities, housing, neighborhood, these particular ways in which we wanted to sort of own and acknowledge race-related economic, social, and political histories. And then how all of these things contributes to positive development, adjust, uh, adjustment, 
and adaption with Black families, but also being mindful of what I would like to call ordinary magic, right? And so these are culturally strength-based assets that Black families have had, our cultural legacies, our history, oral tradition, family values, family cohesion, the important role of racial socialization, racial identity, kinship support, the role of the church, um, spirituality, one's faith, collective socialization, right? Because African-American people, Black Americans are collectivistic by nature, right? That collectivism. When, when, when I win, we all win, right? That's an example of that. And so what's also interesting that I want to point out about the religion and the spirituality piece is that I want um, the audience to keep in mind that the Black church, our spiritual institutions are one of some of the most significant institutions in our community. Because when there were agencies that locked Black families out, some of our child welfare agencies, right, the Black church stepped in, provided assistance for schooling, provided assistance for health. And so we, th th those things are what I like to call culturally strength-based assets, okay? And so racial socialization is an area that um, I focus on a lot of my research. A lot of my research centers, centers around racism, um, experiences with kids in schooling, and how that in, in school context and their schooling experiences and how that shapes their um, education and behavioral health outcomes over time, right, as a developmental psychologist. But one of the culturally strength-based assets that I examine is racial socialization. And this represents family communications to Black youth about how to feel, how to think about their racial group membership, and how to understand and cope with discrimination. Empirical research suggests that racial socialization messages lead to higher uh, adaptive coping processes in terms of dealing with discrimination. And also racial socialization shapes adolescents' identity in terms of who they are and who they want to become, right? And so it's just not telling your child that he or she or they are black, but it's something that's a little bit different. And again, throughout this presentation, I gave you the history of racial violence in America. I wanted to acknowledge that there are different forms of racism, but I would also like to show you all a clip of what racial socialization looks like and what that is, okay? Who said that? The lady at the store. That is not a compliment. Listen, it's an ugly, nasty word, and you are going to hear it. Nothing I can do about that. But you are not going to let that word hurt you. You hear me? There are some people who think you don't deserve the same privileges just because of what you look like. It's not fair. It's not. Remember, you can do anything they can. The difference is you got to work twice as hard and be twice as smart. Come straight home after practice. You got your ID? Yeah. they stop you. How's your review? We're good. You good? Yeah. You see? We're good. OK. Good. Now, when you get pulled over. Um, I'm a good driver. Okay. Baby. Don't worry. This is not about you getting a ticket. This is about you not coming home. I'm going to be OK. Right? OK. okay. Baby. It's not fair. But you keep showing up. You are not pretty for a black girl. You are beautiful, period. Okay? Don't ever forget that. I just wanted to show that clip for a couple of reasons. I think the um, clip is powerful in the sense that it's showing you the type of messaging in different periods, right? Um, and so one of the clips was more older and looked like the six, you know, the seventies, eighties, and then you had one from later to later, um, the late two thousands, twenty two thousand. Yeah, I was right. Yeah, the late two thousands, right? Um, the year two thousand, and so we see that and how that shows up and what that looks like. And so as a result of Black Americans' experience within the U.S., racial socialization is a culturally strength-based asset. Okay, 
And so one of the things that I wanted to do in my own work that I wanted to share with you all is that um, I wanted to focus on um, racial socialization messaging that was specific to three um, ideas that I, um, three concepts that I was very much interested in. Um, I have publications, papers written on racial socialization. They incorporate different sorts of messaging, but I really wanted to be to, to, to understand messaging that that was around that, that that centered around black excellence, that centered around racial pride, that centered around resistance. So a lot of the research that I do is strength-based assets, ways in which black families can be resilient and use resources to thrive, right? And so I was very much so interested in that. And so for this particular study that I'm going to show you all, I was interested in the moderating role of racial socialization messaging on the relationships between racial discrimination and adolescent mental health outcomes. And so I looked at racial discrimination, how bothered Black adolescents were by it, but the frequency in which it occurred, the impact on their mental health outcomes, self-esteem, racial stigma, well-being, and we'll talk about those measures later on, um, and racial socialization messaging that I was interested in that centered on Black excellence, racial pride, and resistance. And so the guiding framework, okay, I'm using the guiding framework that I just talked to you all about, very much interested in accounting for the racial violence, but the messaging that Black parents tell their children around that, that encompasses some of that history. Um, racial discrimination experiences that adolescents are dealing with, their social positioning, also the environment in which these things occur, neighborhoods, their schooling experiences, their race-related daily hassles, right? Because we know from the research literature that I just cited, that African-American adolescents are experiencing at, at, at least five times per day a, a, a racialized incident, right? More than five times. But then I was also interested in the important role of racial socialization, right? But with specific messaging around Black excellence, racial pride, um, and resistance, and how that shaped Black adolescents' development, their well-being. Okay, are they okay? Their well-being, their self-esteem, and the and 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 decreasing their racial stigma, right? Um, that's associated with being a member of their racial and ethnic group. And so, what I did was, as a developmental psychologist, I have access to a lot of data sets because I'm interested in change over time, right? Waves of data. And so, I went back to the research literature to really go through the racial socialization scales and the certain types of messages that they were, that they reported that black families talked about. And I also wanna highlight Wilma King um, because she actually um, looked at the race, racial socialization messages of slave youth in the 19th century. And so we have always been doing this work because of our status in America, okay? So this is not anything new, but I just wanted to highlight that. So I went back to the research literature, right? And reviewed all of these scales. And so now I'm going to talk about the scale that I chose. And so I used a data set where there were 156 African-American adolescents from 18 predominantly black churches in two Midwestern cities. Participants were part of a larger study that examined religious and racial socialization practices. Their age ranged from 12 to 19, the mean age was 15, parents on average had an associate's degree and participants were given a $10 incentive. And so some of the variables that I control for when I get to the model were a parent's education and adolescent's age. So with racial discrimination, I was interested in two of the variables, as you all know, adolescents reported being bothered by discrimination and the frequency of discrimination. So sample question, in the past year, how often have you been ignored, overlooked, or not given service because of your race? So adolescents will rate how bothered they were by that, but also the frequency in which it occurred, okay? And also the measure that I went with was Demo and Hughes, um, Cleo Caldwell and Philip Bowman. So I was very, very, very much interested in that. Um, and so, Let's see here. Okay, so I wanna go through these models. I'm sorry, these items for you all, because I want you all to see 
how at the very beginning, um, when I talked about black pride, racial pride, when I talked about black excellence, and when I talked about resistance, why these particular items stood out to me. And so number one, my parents teach or model to me that the achievements by African Americans or blacks are equally important as achievements from other racial ethnic groups. Keep in mind what I was looking for at the very, very beginning. My parents teach or model to me never to be ashamed to be African American or black. My parents teach or model to me not to give white people or others special treatment. My parents teach or model to me to stand up for my rights. My parents teach or model to me that Black History Month is every month. My parents teach or model to me never to forget my past, for example, slavery and segregation. My parents teach or model to me that it is important to learn about people from the continent of Africa. My parents teach or model to me the importance of celebrating African-American or Black holidays such as MLK Day or Kwanzaa. My parents teach or model to me that some white people place barriers in front of minorities. My parents teach or model to me that racial barriers do not block African-Americans or Blacks from succeeding. So again, when I was looking for um, 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 variables that got at Black excellence, I was interested in racial pride, and I was interested in resistance. And I felt as if these variables um, at least got at that. Not only were parents teaching their kids this, but they were also modeling it, right? So it was that agency, that action that was behind it as well. And so what I did was I did an exploratory factor analysis, went through all of the you know, the indices that you're supposed to go through, the KMO um, and the Bartlett's test um, to make sure that the variables were suitable for the factor analysis. Um, I used screen plots to look at the number of factors that were extracted. The KMO was an appropriate value. Um, and so the total amount of that variance was 51% of these items and a Chromebox Alpha was pretty healthy, 0.75. And so I came up with like these two scales, right, based on the exploratory factor analysis. And so one is what I call racial pride and resistance. My parents teach or model to me that the achievements by African Americans or Blacks are equally important as achievements from other racial ethnic groups. My parents teach or model to me never to be ashamed to be African American or Black. My parents teach or model to me to stand up for their, for, um, I'm sorry, for my rights. And so for me, that was racial pride and resistance. The significance of race and history in America, again, keeping in mind the historical model that I talked about, um, the socio-historical integrative model. Um, so some of these items, my parents teach or model to me not to give white people other special treatment. My parents teach or model to me that Black History Month is every month. My parents teach or model to me never to forget my past. My parents um, teach or model to me that it is important to learn about people from the continent of Africa. My parents teach or model to me the importance of celebrating African-American holidays such as MLK Day or Kwanzaa. And my parents teach or model to me that some white people place barriers in front of minorities. And so these were the two scales that I was very much interested in that I felt, again, you all linked on to Black excellence, racial pride, and resistance. And so what were the outcome variables? Psychological well-being, right? I have a sense of direction and purpose in my life. That's a sample item. I was also interested in racial stigma. And so one of those questions are being around black people makes me feel good. Black people are just as smart as everyone else. Um, Self-esteem, I feel that I have a number of good qualities, right? So this is what I call mental health, right? The well-being overall about how black adolescents are doing. And so these are some of the uh, means and standard deviations. Um, we see here that on average, you know, African-American adolescents are being bothered by discrimination. They're, they, 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 you know, they are experiencing this, um, both in being bothered and frequency. We see that parents are indeed communicating messaging. And this, again, this is what adolescents perceive their parents to sort of be teaching or modeling to them, racial pride and resistance, and the, the significance of race and history. And we see how the variables look. And for racial stigma, the higher that scale is, the more likely adolescents don't endorse negative messages about who they are and what they believe. Okay, and so I ran a GLM multivariate model. This is a very huge model because of the three outcome variables. I am going to present each of the outcome variables, the model on a separate slide, so you all can see um, the findings. And I think it just is, is visually better. Um, 
it's easier on eyes, right? And so what we see here is four significant variables. We see adolescent age, which is um, significantly um, predictive of self-esteem. So what that means is that older adolescents were more likely to have to, to report higher levels, levels of self-esteem. We also have the significance of racial history, which was associated with Black adolescent self-esteem. So that means that the messages that Black parents were communicating to their children, teaching or modeling about the significance of Black history, the significance about the past, um, the, the importance of learning about the continent of Africa, right? The importance that Black History Month is every month um, was associated with Black adolescent self-esteem. And then we have two interactions that I'm going to talk about right in the next slide because I probe further to try to see, you know, to understand that particular relationship. And so what we see here is that when adolescents report higher experiences of being bothered by discrimination, right, being bothered by discrimination, um, they're receiving higher levels of racial pride and resistance for their families led to higher self-esteem, right? And so if an adolescent is feeling bothered, they're, they're, they're feeling down about what they're experiencing, these messages that their parents are giving them is countering that, right? Is reducing that negative impact of these experiences and is promoting self-esteem. However, we see the opposite here. And we're gonna talk about this in a discussion section that I'm um, excited to get to. And so what we see here, we see something different. We see that under conditions in which adolescents are experiencing higher rates, the frequency of racial discrimination they're reporting in higher numbers, those whose parents are talking to them higher levels about racial pride and resistance, they have lower self-esteem. And so it's not really beneficial for Black adolescents who are experiencing frequency of um, racial discrimination at higher rates and hearing this messaging from their parents is associated with lower self-esteem, but it's different in terms of them being bothered by it. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that means um, when I get to the conclusion section. And so what we have here is racial stigma. We see that adolescents are more likely to endorse a healthier stigma, but we do see with the frequency of racial discrimination higher reports of experiencing racial discrimination, the daily hassle, Black adolescents are more likely to endorse negative values about who they are based on their racial group membership, right? And then again, we see almost statistically significant um, the significance of race and history in America. And so what, what, what does all of this mean, right? So what do these numbers mean? We'll talk about it. And so well-being. We see here that adolescents, older adolescents have a healthier well-being, but we also see a significant interaction with race and history again, right? The importance of history. We see that adolescents who perceive these messages at higher rates from their parents were more likely to have a healthier psychological well-being. So the past, the history matters in both cases of self-esteem and well-being for Black adolescents. And so what are the conclusions, right? What, what's the take home point, right? So the importance of racial socialization, significance of race and history in America, higher reports of well-being and self-esteem we, we've talked about. It corroborates previous studies on the importance of racial socialization messaging, but it also has implications for culturally responsive curriculum and academic settings. If we know that adolescents who have parents that are talking to them about the significance of race and history as Black Americans in the United States, then we should not be making efforts to reject the 1619 Project. We should not be making efforts, right, to discourage African American adolescents in settings learning about themselves, okay? The next finding, the importance role of racial socialization, racial pride and resistance. And so we saw a protective role for Black adolescents who reported higher levels of being bothered by racial discrimination, racial pride and resistance. However, it was a risk factor for Black adolescents reporting higher levels of encountering discrimination experiences, right? The racial pride and resistance. And what I think what's happening here is that there's a sensitive developmental period, right? Because we had a huge sort of age range, 12 to 19. But I also think that Black adolescents, when their parents are communicating messages to them, then perhaps they can control the affect of effective component by it, right? It helps with the effective component. My parents are talking to me about race, then uh, about race and racism in America. 
then I may not be as bothered by it. But if their parents are talking to them about this, but these incidences are still happening, they can't control that, right? And so I think this sort of leads to racial battle fatigue syndrome that we've barely talked about with Black adolescents to date, in which they are probably experiencing some exhaustion from this. And so what are the next steps? We need to use mixed methodology to really understand what's going on in real time as adolescents cope with racial discrimination experiences, right? So this is this idea of we need daily diaries to sort of map on what adolescents are experiencing on a daily basis, and also in-depth interviews to really understand what's going on. And so what were some of the limitations of this? I think a large scale longitudinal survey can help provide information about these specific types of messaging as a protective mechanism. The sample size was small. I think we need a larger sample size. And these findings, as, is, as a result, I don't think these findings are generalizable. Um, the study was also based on self-report data. We've talked about the important use of mixed methodology. But I also want to say that caution should be taken, right? Because the current study sample was a sample recruited from African-American churches. And so adolescents within a different contextual setting, such as school or community, or who may not attend church may respond in a very different way, okay? And so this leads us to what is anti-Black racism, right? And so I was looking for the perfect definition that sort of encompassed the, the, the four forms of um, um, racism that I talked about earlier. And so I came across this bald spot by Ms. Gamblin. And I love the way in which she terms it, right? She, she defines what anti-Black racism is. So anti-Black racism is the name of the specific kind of racial prejudice directed towards Black people. Anti-Blackness devalues Blackness while systematically marginalizing Black people, the issues that affect us and the institutions created to support us. The first form of anti-Blackness is overt racism which is upheld by this covert structural and systemic racism that categorically predetermines the socioeconomic status of Blacks in this country. The second form of anti-Blackness is unethical disregard for Black people as seen in the cases of police or civilian brutality against Black bodies. And so this encompasses the four different forms of racism, anti-Black um, uh, racism that we talked about in the way in which she described anti-Black racism. And so how do we confront anti-Black racism in practice? What does that look like? Well, we need the importance of narrative. And so while we are, while you all are working with clients, um, regardless if you are in a youth serving organization, if you are in a school setting, if you are in a medical setting, it is important to understand Black families' lived experiences and how the conditions of COVID-19 pandemic and also the racial violence and racial injustice that Black families have to contend with on a daily basis, the history of America itself, it's important that we begin to ask how people are doing right? How are you today? How are you feeling in this moment? We need an awareness of history and racial trauma. A lot of us believe that some of these things just occur. We treat some of these things as trends. Black families have always had to deal with this. So there is an awareness of history and racial trauma that one has to take into consideration. And also, what are you bringing as a practitioner in that space? What are your practice-related experiences? How do you show up? If you're not a person from that population, how have you treated that population in your work, particularly in your day-to-day -day interaction? Are you using one-size-fits-all models to explain what Black families are going through today? Are you viewing Black families from a cultural deficit perspective? So let me give you an example of that. The Moni Ha Report was written in 1964 or 65. And in 2021, it still damages Black single Black mothers because that report back then said that the demise implicated with very flawed analysis that single Black women were to blame, single Black mothers were to blame for the demise of the Black family. I still see that perpetuated in some research today. We need to unlearn that. And we need to be intentional about unlearning that. And so within your own work, is it promoting a cultural deficit perspective? Your training, what is the training our service providers and educators are getting, right? not only an anti-racism, but also anti-Black racism as well. You can be anti-racist, but you can still be promoting anti-Black practices and research daily. You can do both. Gap gazing. Are we just looking at the numbers of certain populations and creating it as a checklist and then assigning them to be at risk? 
not even asking them about their narrative or their lived experience. And also the othering versus the oppression Olympics. Othering, are we viewing white populations and grouping black people with other sort of populations as well too, the underrepresented minority group? And then I'm gonna get to researchers on the next slide because this is what this is leading to. Are you comparing your sample to what you deem as superiority? You are promoting anti-Black racism in practice and also the oppression Olympics. Do you find yourself having conversations with others and when they're talking about issues of Black people, what's going on to, in society, you feel the need to bring up other groups and say, well, don't forget about this. That's the lack of knowledge around intersectionality, but it's also a deliberateness in terms of the person that's stating that and e e erasing Black history and Black culture and not even really wanting to talk about it. It's okay to sit with it. Black families have to, right? Black people in America have to. So again, these are things that you just wanna be um, cognizant of in your day-to-day -day practice. So now I'm gonna to get to us researchers, the importance of narrative. Are we using secondary data sets that have antiquated tools, measures, variables, um, that tell the, that attempts to tell a story about black populations, but not even the narrative part of it. Is there awareness of history and racial trauma and some of the variables? How are we using our models to look at that, right? Models meaning our theoretical models that we're using. And also what are you bringing as a researcher? Especially if you are not a member of this population. If you study black families, are you using a one size fits all model? Are the measures that you're using culturally responsive or have they been normed on white middle-class families? Are you endorsing a cultural deficit perspective? An example can, of that can be the fact that I hear very often that black men have a lower life expectancy. Well, if you don't tell the history that they can't even go outside and eat a bag of Skittles or play in a park, then you're not telling the entire story. So are you promoting a cultural deficit perspective? Are you explaining some of these inequities and injustices that you see with Black families? Are you taking the historical perspective into consideration? And also we need to be very intentional about this in our research methods courses and the way that, we teach, that, that we're teaching our students. Also, we tend to gap gaze. We're so enamored with these analysis that we begin to put Black families into categories, not really understanding that Black families are monolith, that Black families are very diverse and they're, they differ in terms of family configuration. So that's something that we have to actively, actively unlearn, right? And so also the comparison. Do you find yourself comparing Black families to white families, Black populations to white, um, to, 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 to white populations for absolutely no reason at all? Then you are promoting the superior versus inferior. You're doing that, anti-Black racism. So a lot of these tools that I'm giving you all are just suggested, you know, suggestions to really make sure that when we talk about Black families, that we talk about Black families equitably, that we use the science in our practice to uplift, to uplift Black families and view Black families from a straight-faced lens. And so I'm looking very forward to the conversation right now. Um, I'm very excited to hear what you all have to say. And that is what I have today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnes. This was really an incredible, incredible and insightful talk. And there's no better evidence of that than the activity that has been happening within wow. the chat. There's a, a whole lot of folks that are, uh, you know, virtually nodding their head yes, clapping their hands, agreeing, offering their thoughts. Um, and I've jotted a few of the questions that have come up and I know Janet has done the same. So we'll probably just, you know, okay. um, tennis ball these back and forth. One of the questions that was asked was how is, how is age associated with self-esteem in your study? Oh, so it was just, a, thank you for asking that. I'm sorry. And I apologize for not uh, clarifying that. So older African-American adolescents were more likely to have higher rates of self-esteem. So older adolescents. Oh, well, have lower rates or higher rates? Higher rates of self-esteem. Okay, I'm sorry. Very good. Thank you. No, no, yeah. thank you. Um, I'll ask one more and then I'll hand it over to Janet. It's I'm wondering if the study accounts for inter intraracial racism, i.e., dysphoria, interpersonal relationships. Nope. We were interested in the because of black adolescents' experiences on a day-to-day -day basis, 
I was very much interested in the way in which we use, adolescents use strength-based assets on the more interpersonal interactions that they have every day, them being bothered and the frequency by that. So that was very intentional. Excellent. So I want to add just one follow on on the question of age correlating with self esteem as a developmental psychologist. Were you surprised by that or does that track with what you expect of um, preteen and pu puberty years being really hard and then people finding their stride Absolutely. as they near adulthood. Yeah, so that's a great question. And so with that, I do think that because adolescence is this time of the formation of identity, and I do think as adolescents get older, they're more likely to sort of accept who they are, um, um, you know, who they want to be, their identity is formed in different ways that the younger kiddos aren't. So as a developmental psychologist, I was not um, as surprised by that. But then also the next step in this work is to stratify by age group. So perhaps we're going to do early, middle, and late adolescence to really sort of understand what's going on. So I think that's the next step for this work. Thank you for asking. Sure. Um, I can ask one more and then pitch it back to Gary. Um, so a couple of people are coming at, I think, a, a related issue a few different ways, which is um, in research, what are your thoughts about um, when the issue is race or when it's race is kind of um, used as a proxy for questions of class or um, other socioeconomic attainments. Um, j yeah. Just anything you'd want to comment on that. Yeah, so when race is used as a proxy, I'm not okay with that either. Um, I think that you have to be very intentional and you have to be knowledgeable about it. Because what I tend to hear sometimes is people use black, low income and poverty interchangeably. And that's, and those are, that's very different. And I think we have to be very intentional in why we're including race, especially if we know that there are existing health educational and incarceration disparities, especially the fact that we should not ignore the past. There's a reason why, how race shows up and we should be in race and ethnicity and we should be I'm comfortable talking about it. And one of the things I wanted to say, just real quick, Janet, I'm sorry, um, is that there are also unique experiences for, for Black immigrants as well. And so Black American is the, is the term that I'm using sort of as this umbrella, but I also have work where I've, I've, I've looked at Black immigrants as well. So I hope that answers their question. Anyone so Sharita, we, we have evidence that the, the folks in our audience today have been coming to a lot of open classrooms because now they're comparing points that were raised by other researchers okay. and wanting to get your thoughts. Okay. And, um, and, and of course, Peggy, I think is here, you know, I'm, I'm going to read her question because I think she's at every open classroom we, we hold. And so a, a previous researcher has suggested that using the term racial buys into an idea that there are different races when there are not. And it promotes the idea that somehow there are different subspecies, which there are not. What are your thoughts on using the term race? Um, race is a social construction and race has very real implications for oppressed populations. Mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately, because it's a social construction, um, we've given power to that, but removing yeah. that will also be detrimental as well too, because we do need to understand the unique experiences of black populations and other like indigenous um, Latinx and pan Asian communities. I also find that if persons are not from that particular population, then the, those statements make sense. But then when you're actually studying race in context, right? When we look at the very real racialized experience, especially the racial violence that have occurred in America, that's a term that we just have to sort of sit with and be uncomfortable with. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, well, you, I think you may have touched on this already. Uh, one person just wanted to say that they thought it was important to recognize that when race is being used as a proxy for another measure, socioeconomics, genetics, ancestry, that we should account for that. Any? Account for, or I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Account for what? I think it's more of a statement. I think it's also important to recognize when race is being used as a proxy for another measure, such as socioeconomics, oh, sure. genetics, and ancestry, sure. to account for that. Exactly. 
because that's inherent like anti-black racism as well too i mean what is the what are the reasons that we're sort of using these things and and to mm. and and we do injustice when we use these things synonymously like they don't mean the same thing they're all different yeah oh so, yeah thank you for that yeah so uh, i'd like to ask kind of a three-part question if i could um and i i I know you in real life enough to know that you are um, a tremendously thoughtful and empowering parent. And yeah. you get to sort of some the impact that parents can have not to totally protect, but to be a protective factor for young people. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of key takeaways of what you've learned for, for parents, mm -hmm. for educators, and then for talking to policymakers. And that, that's my trifecta. Yeah, parents, policy make parents, say it again, educators and policymakers. Yes, please. Yeah. And so I think for parents, um, Black parents have almost always, and even if you are a um, non Black parent, but you have a Black child, I think it's important that you engage in what we like to term the talk, because not acknowledging that racism exists or not acknowledging that your child may encounter racialized or gendered experiences because of their social identities, I think is a disadvantage and it sort of sets them up um, for disappointment. And so there's research that shows the importance of racial socialization and talking to your kids about who they are is associated with a better outcome, how they love themselves and also their academic achievement. And so I think it's important that we have parent resource groups, that we make space for that. But I encourage for you all to talk to your children about race. I also want to say that it's not only for Black parents, Black parents to do that, but I also think that white parents need to be having conversations with their children about race too. We all need to be doing it. That's the first right. thing. The second thing for educators is that I do think that we need to really understand what Black children have been learning, and, and all children, because Black history is not only important for us, everybody's history is, is important for everybody, right? The most important classrooms that promote the highest academic achievement are classrooms that are more racially and ethnically diverse. And they have teachers that are representative of the students that are sitting in that classroom. And so I think it's important that Black kids learn history outside of MLK, Martin Luther King, and Rosa Parks. We see that a lot in school. So this has implications for social studies and our history classes. And right now with the current debate about around some of our politicians trying to get rid of the 1619 project, using a revisionist history lens. So I think that schools have to be brave enough, critical enough to understand that history matters, not just for us, but for everybody. At the policy level, we need to revamp our education and the way that we're talking but also we, our, our federal folks need to know the different forms of racism as well too. Because just because you speak to one doesn't mean you're not tackling the other one, right? And so I think that we all have to have common knowledge and then that way, because I'm thinking about the US Department of Education, I'm thinking about the denial of what's going on. So I think this work has education. Um, um, I think this work has um, implications for education policy. I think is useful for classrooms, and that's the way I think that parents can continue, all parents. Thank you for that. This always happens that we can make an hour go by so no. quick. Oh, sorry. I, I have one little thing that I want to ask you, and I hate to put you on the spot, oh gosh, but I recognize, I recognize that some, um, some material is like copyright protected. There was a lot of interest in the, uh, the framework that you showed, and um, it's obviously a part of your PowerPoint deck. Would you be okay with me posting the PowerPoint deck as a PDF to our website, or would that be a problem? You can post it to our website. I actually got permission for some of the pictures that were in there, but if they just want the specific model, the yeah. I I can I can just send an article. That's a, I can just do that because that's where you know it's in it's in the paper and it would be interesting to sort of read around it but I, but just please post it just to what you just said about our information. perfect anything perfect. i will post the presentation to the free resources part of open classrooms website for those of you that were looking for that and then Di dr butler burns if there's anything else that you want to share um with this group you let me know and we'll figure out how to get it to you okay thank you all so with that, we're, we're nearing time. Are there any 
final comments or a closing thought that you want to send this group out with? Me? Yeah, you. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> y'all. I went on. Okay, no, no, no. So, um, I do want to say a couple of things. I, I want to say that it is important for every person on here to have an honest conversation with your child, regardless of race and ethnicity, gender identity, about um, how their experience might be different, but to have conversations and talks about race. I think we also want to demand more of our education and be supportive of our teachers who are trying to use innovative and creative techniques to address this issue. And I also want us to be kind to people and center youth voice and family voice. When we're talking about issues that are impacting black families, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating impact on the black community. Um, and then we're talking about racial violence, be kind to one another, love one another and just meet people where they're at. That's my take home. Amen to all of that. Thank yeah. you so much. I, I hope that you've gotten a chance to see some of this chat because this has been um, affirming and there's just so, there's just so yeah. much good stuff, so much good energy. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us. Thank you, Gary, for being just the most thank amazing. Thank you all. Host. Awesome. And um, everybody out there, please stay healthy and safe. Um, we're hoping to actually maybe be announcing another talk um, with Dr. Butler Barnes coming soon. So more to come on this very important topic. Thank you. Bye, everybody.